JT, I've got a question which I can't answer. Well, I couldn't answer before I had something open in front of me. How many of the rare earth elements can you name? And I personally couldn't name one of them. That's how appalling I am as well. Can you name a rare earth? Uh, no, 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 don't worry if you can't. 99% of the UK, of the world population can't. I would say more than 99%. Mm, I'm, I'm going to bow out no, of this one. I, didn't, I couldn't have named any of them. Uh, but it, they are the most important... They are, as our next guest said, they're the vitamins of modern technology, and he'll explain why in a moment. So we do need to know more about these. As the global race for rare earths heats up, countries are looking to step up their own capacities and challenge China's dominance. Now, Ramon Barua Costa is the CEO of Aclara. Uh, Ramon, this is going to be partly you explain the investment thesis and partly education. So let's start off with the education, all the backdrop first. The appalling fact that I couldn't name one of them as well, um, from cerium to lanthanum to neodymium, uh, scandium, etc., etc. That, that's almost irrelevant. What is relevant is the fact that these are critical to the globe going forward. Just explain to viewers and me why. Absolutely, Steve and Juliana, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, they are indeed very important. Uh, uh, very recently, you know, with the advent of electric vehicles, uh, uh, the sector has uh, received a, a, what I like to call a tsunami of demand. Really, of the 17 different elements, you basically need to remember four of them, no? Two light rivers that are neodymium and praseodymium, and they're important because the neodymium magnet is the most powerful magnet in the world relative to its size and weight. Um, and the other two are dysprosium and terbium, and they're important because they are the most uh, scarce ones, and uh, they are added to the magnets in order to uh, ensure that they can sustain high temperatures. So an electric vehicle that has a motor that runs at around 200 degrees uh, Celsius requires these four elements in order to perform. Now that's just the beginning because adding to electric vehicles you have wind turbines, you have uh, uh, drones that today are toys but eventually they are going to be carrying weights and passengers and eventually also and robotics. Weaponry, which they're doing in, in the appalling Russo-Ukraine war as well. Okay, so that's the, the, the original backdrop. Now, education part two. They're not rare, are they? Rare earths aren't rare. Well, that's a great question because uh, they are indeed not rare, but if they are not rare, then why are they critical, no? Uh, and, and the answer to that is uh, each of these 17 elements has its own business case, no? We need to understand them individually and not as a whole. Uh, uh, and the fact is that uh, especially heavy rivers are rather rare, no, mm -hmm. in comparison. I can give you just a, a, a data point, no? Yeah, no, please do. Uh, there are some rivers, like the ones you mentioned, land and Syrian, for example, they sell for $1 a kilo, while there are others, like the ones I described, for example, Terbium ser sells for $1,000 a kilo. Uh, because, again, they are relatively more scarce. And the third part of the education, before you get on to the invest investing questions, I'm yes. sure, from Juliana, is um, even though they're not rare and they have this wide variance in value per kilo, the fact of the matter is there is one country that dominates the supply of these globally, that is China, and we need to de-risk in the West to a certain degree. Absolutely. China has discovered the powers of, of rivers uh, since the 1970s, and they have been developing quite aggressively their, 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 their industry. I like to say China is a formidable competitor, and they have prepared very well for this uh, situation. Mm. Brazil, meanwhile, has, I understand, the world's second largest rare earth reserves after China. Why has the West been slow to develop these resources when China has been so quick and been at it for so many years? Yes, the main reason is because uh, most of the applications of rivers historically have, have been rather niche, you know, applications. But now, as I mentioned, with the advent of electric vehicles and other technologies like robotics, they are becoming more and more important. How does Brazil's, I mean, now that, you know, as, as Steve highlighted, there are so many, and, and as you highlighted, there's so many um, different types of rare earths here. So when we talk about what is available, what is actually is in Brazil and how it compares to what China has access to. Can you just frame it for us, how yes. the opportunity compares? Yes, look, uh, when we say that rivers are not rare, 99% of the deposits in, term of, in terms of number contain basically the rivers that have very little value. Those that have very high value are called ionic clays, and that's what China has in their southern border, and also they are present in Myanmar and, and Vietnam and a little bit in Malaysia. Uh, Brazil has exactly the same. No, Brazil and Chile, as a matter of fact, 
uh, uh, are two countries where we have found ioni ionic clays. Uh, and these ionic clays have three important characteristics. First, the metallurgy, so extracting the rares from the clays is very easy and environmentally very sustainable. You just need to put the, the clays in contact with water and ammonium sulfate, which is a common fertilizer, and you extract them. The second advantage is that they contain the heavy rivers, which are the most scarcer ones and, and, and the most valuable ones. And the third one is rivers are typically also found with radioactivity, uranium and thorium. But in ionic clays, it's very easy to, to, to not concentrate those elements. So essentially, it's, it's negligible. Uh, you don't need to worry about radioactivity. I mean, when you, when you frame it like that and talk to us about what's you know, available in Brazil, it sounds great. I mean, what a, what a great way for the West to reduce its dependence on China. Uh, but what's the catch? Does it come down to cost or difficulty of mining some of these rare earths? What's, what's, the, what's the catch? Yes, it's, it's definitely associated to cost. No? The way in, in which China competes in rare earths and many other industries is that they have built also an amazing uh, infrastructure. And they assume that all of that infrastructure is already fully depreciated. So they compete at the marginal cost of production. We in the West, we need to build those uh, facilities. And that's why it seems so important that governments, the European Union, the U.S. government, do support the industry at the, at the, starting, uh, at the starting of the cycle in order to ensure that we can access low-cost funding in order to compete in price with China. And yet, as we know, the web of interrelated interests in the West has been challenged by Mr. Trump's uh, tariff war. So if you are going to sell these products primarily to the United States and elsewhere, you need facilities in the United States. And that's why I think it's really fascinating you saying you're going to be mining in Brazil and elsewhere, but Brazil, uh, but, but the MOU you signed with Germany's VAC for a Pentagon-backed facility in South Carolina? Correct. I think that's fascinating. So this is a, an interesting way of negotiating, dare I say, any political connotations as well. It is absolutely fascinating. I coincide with you because what we're trying to do is, uh, and this is important for our customers, is to have an integrated approach from, that goes for all the way from mine to magnet. There are different stages. You are going to be mining the clays, concentrating and producing a carbonate. Then you have to separate it into individual oxides. And those are stages that are fully uh, uh, dominated by China. Then you have to produce the alloys and then the magnets. So in us, in doing this strategic partnership with Vacuum Schmelzer or VAC, uh, we can offer customers in the US, in the European Union, and in Japan, an a, a, a fully integrated uh, solution, again, that goes from mine to magnet. Ramon, um, I'm going to go back to something you touched on with Juliana as well. And you talked in your answer about the fully depreciated value of the mining facilities or in Brazil. The problem is, now the world's woken up to the big new shiny thing. Or oh, I don't know if they're shiny or not, but anyway, we'll call them. Say, say, uh, uh, when you have so many players now waking up to the need to de-risk the supply chains and invest in rare earths, you know as well as I do, we see a picks and shovel mining boom and then potentially we see the market oversupplied. Are you worried about those scenarios, what you painted at the start of the conversation, where you can see $1,000 a kilo for some of these and actually that's going to go down aggressively if we see this booming activity? I do not worry at all. No, let me give you a few uh, data points. The first one is I saw some uh, research published by S&P Global of $100 that go into exploration today in the world, around 40% of that is going into gold. And less than $1 is going into rare earths. No? Mm -hmm. So rare earths, I believe, is, is currently under underexplored. And then the other numbers have to do with a, a, the current market a situation. No? Right now, for example, in the case of this problem, which is a, a very scarce element, a, the, mark, the size of the global market is 3,300 tons per year, and that is fully dominated by China. Independent analysts think that by the year 2030, 2031, that number is going to double. So let's assume that in, in, in four or five years, we're going to be needing, you know, around six to 7,000 tons of this prosum. At Aclara, where we have, I believe, the two leading projects in the world in terms of ionic clays outside of China, we can produce 240 tons yearly. So it's still a drop in the ocean. Now there's going to be a lot of demand in a sector that is completely undersupplied. Fascinating. Um, all aspects of that conversation, absolutely loved as well. You explained everything we need to know about why rare earths are, what they are, and where they are, and who's dominating, and what the politics are. So thank you so much indeed it's a pleasure. Uh, for joining Juliana and myself, Ramon. Ramon Barua Costa, who is the CEO of Aclara.